bringing you part two today, looking at the contrast between the British 1958 pattern and the uh, DDR's UTV equipment, which was never actually introduced into service, but draws heavily on the 1958 pattern in terms of fixtures and fittings and design elements. So it's quite interesting to compare the two, quite interesting to see an Eastern Bloc country take on sort of a Western, uh, Western design elements in a, designing a new equipment set. I've talked about the uniforms on the mannequins in part one. If you want to see about those, go and check out part one. What we're doing today, of course, is looking at the components in more detail. So that's what we're going to do now. We'll start this closer look with the, the belts from the two equipment sets. And of course, at the top here, we have the 1958 pattern. And at the bottom, we have the UTV belt. Um, interestingly, the uh, MVA had actually gone back to uh, sort of slightly further back than the 58 pattern in that this method of adjustment with, with clips at the end of the belt here, which hook into the pockets, dates back to the 1937 pattern web equipment. Uh, and, then, and to a degree, the 1944 pattern, although that was a three-part belt, that was a slightly different design again. This had been reintroduced for the PLC in British service, which of course was coming into service at this time. Uh, the belt on that adjusts on one side using this sort of method. Um, but the 1958 pattern had gone to a more American style with the eyelets down the centre there with a the hook. Otherwise, very similar. Um, you have the pockets on the 1958 pattern here to take the hooks on the equipment uh, so they don't slide around on the belt. Obviously, one other feature peculiar to that system is the D-rings on the belt here, which are to allow you to suspend the poncho carrier, the cape carrier beneath the belt at the rear. So uh, small design differences there, but I'm, I'm sure you can see the the, uh, the influence is quite strong here uh, from the, the British equipment to the, uh, the uh, MVA equipment. Okay, as ever, a little bit difficult to film the uh, bigger items like the yokes here, but we'll see how we get on. Uh, this is an interesting bit to look at because they are, um, it's probably where the influence of the 1958 pattern is most clearly clearly shown uh, in, the, uh, in the UTV equipment. Um, and we can see that here, looking at the back, these, these uh, brace attachments, you want to call them that, the C-hooks, obviously directly copied essentially from the um, 1958 pattern as a method of attaching the yoke to the belt. As you can see there, essentially the same design. Uh, but made in nylon, of course. Similarly, the rest of the yoke, you have a padded section across the back here, padded sections up to here uh, on the shoulders, so they're actually a bit longer on the UTV equipment. Um, a bit stiffer, uh, it's not quite a softer padding material, um, but not by, not by much. Uh, I'd say that it still spreads the weight quite nicely. Um, obviously, we have additional fittings here, uh, this being to take, as far as I'm aware, to take the um, uh, chemical suit in its role and then obviously at the back here we have again the specific uh, attachment point for the entrenching tool which is part of the British equipment set um, or, or a piece of equipment associated with it. Uh, you can also see here the, the guides which take the um, uh, hooks on the straps for the uh, for the pack when it's worn but in terms of the actual way this attaches and supports the belt it's essentially a copy. If we turn this over to have a look at the front of the UTV uh, the suspenders or yoke as you, whichever term you prefer to use uh, depending on where you're from uh, there's one major difference I'll turn these over here as I say a little bit awkward to, to do this and keep everything in frame but we'll do our best so we've already talked about the two pockets on the front here possibly for dressings not entirely sure on that but the UTV equipment does away with the uh, attachment point on the back of the pouches for the straps. So you basically have another brace point of attachment at the front here, uh, what I call brace attachments. Um, they're sort of known like that when they're independent with the 1958 pattern. You need them, of course, with the 1958 to attach these straps at the front to the belt if you're not wearing pouches, whereas they're permanently attached to the yoke in terms of the UTV equipment. Just a slight difference in thinking. As already discussed when talking about this in comparison to the M1956, it does mean that the pouches of the 1958 pattern are directly supported by the yoke because this loops through the back of the pouches and attaches up to the buckle here. Um, as I say, other than that, very, very similar. Um, and obviously the differences in terms of attaching equipment and the extra pockets and things, uh, which are simply due to the peculiarities of the equipment that was to be carried and worn with the, uh, with the uh, UTV and 1958 respectively. But otherwise, I hope you can see there the influence is very clear again between the 1958 pattern and the UTV in terms of fixtures, fittings, and the way it clips together. Here we have the ammunition pouches from the two equipment sets, and I've also included the grenade pouch here uh, from the UTV equipment. Um, again, you can probably see from the fixtures and fittings, the design influence, uh, obviously the quick release tab here. If we flip these over, you can see the copied uh, C hooks on the back there in terms of attaching the equipment to the belt. But you also have belt loops, which is a common feature across the pouches, and. and the respirator, have a sack and so forth for the UTV equipment. You have both belt loops and 
the uh, Seahawks. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The difference in design thinking can be seen here. Obviously, Western equipment, you tend to see having two ammunition pouches, one on each hip at the front. Um, Eastern Bloc, you tend to have one uh, ammunition pouch on the right hip, if I remember correctly. Yes, on the right hip as you wear the equipment. Just trying to visualize it in my head there. And then we have the addition of a grenade pouch, which have been commonly seen in, in Soviet use for quite some time. Uh, the MVA did have a grenade pouch prior to this equipment, but you don't tend to see them used very often. And it seems that this is a, and it, it was sort of an adjunct to the equipment rather than being a specific part. Indeed, this is the first time you sort of see a, a purpose designed set of equipment that all clips together and everything. Prior to that, you'd have various different um, designs of bottle uh, that with incremental uh, developments and, and different pouches and so forth that could all be worn with the standard um, uh, suspenders and, and belt. For the first time here, you have pouches which are made, obviously both, they're, made, they're both made in Strixtarn. Uh, they're both made to, to fit with the equipment that's fixed and fittings are standard. And this is sort of a new direction. Uh, and obviously, as I say, the quick release tab is drawn directly from the 1958 pattern equipment. There's no grenade pouch for the 1958 pattern equipment. Um, my understanding is officially grenades were to be carried inside pouches uh, within your ammunition pouches, but that was often um, not the case. You do see them clipped onto web equipment uh, on occasion. A specific pouch to carry grenades and the equipment was quite predominant in Warsaw Pact countries. And obviously that's been uh, perpetuated here with the UTV equipment in having the um, having the grenade pouch. Uh, in terms of fixtures and fittings, again, if we flip this over, you can see they're basically standardized on the back here. You have two sets of C-hooks and belt loops. Uh, the belt loops on the ammunition pouch, one thing I would say in terms of um, manufacturing, these are a bit tight really to fit over the, the belt of the UTV equipment set, whereas the ones on the grenade pouch, you can see they're a lot looser and they do fit on a lot more easily. Uh, you have to remember the buckle is somewhat wider than the belt, so you need uh, capacity for that to, to fit through. Um, if we turn this over here, again, you can see um, the C-hooks on the British equipment are a little bit more um, a refined design than those on the UTV. They are shaped so that they fit into the pockets and hook in. You can see there's a, they're narrower uh, when they neck, they neck in here, basically, towards the end of the hook. They're made of aluminium, uh, anodized aluminium, and the ends are finished quite nicely, so you don't have any sharp edges. These appear to be made of steel, the ones on the UTV, and they have very rough, imagine a, a piece of wire just cut, you've got the rough bird edge, uh, and that means, particularly with the belt being made of nylon, it can be a real pain to get these into the pockets on the back of the belt, which of course are intended to stop the piece of, different pieces of equipment, different pouches and so forth sliding around. Um, that is a real pain, or can be. Uh, the belt is very stiff, being made of nylon, and it's difficult to fold these into the pockets on the back, especially when they snag. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether the belt loops and the hooks were meant to be used. Uh, that is the case with the British PLCE, the nylon equipment which was coming around at this time. You had belt loops and then you'd have a C hook to stop the equipment sliding around. Belt loops to carry it on the webbing and then a C hook to stop it sliding. Uh, obviously you do have two C hooks here, so it is possible to attach these just using the C hooks. But if you use the belt loops too, it holds it a bit closer to the belt at the edges and stops things sort of flopping away from the belt as much. So a belt and braces approach, I guess, it does work quite well uh, when it's assembled as an equipment set. Disassembling it and then obviously at the end of this, reassembling it is gonna be an absolute pain, but it's worth doing to have a look at all the, the, you know, the different features. But as I say, that's one feature directly copied as well as the, the quick release tabs. But obviously it's interesting to see that design uh, feature, uh, that method of attaching equipment to a belt just applied to what is essentially a, a, an Eastern block design of magazine pouch. If we open this up here, we can see inside the four compartments in there. If I get the light in here, the four compartments in there. If we take your, your uh, AKM magazines, I forget the uh, MVA uh, designation, the, the DDR designation off the top of my head. I'm sure someone will post in the comments. Um, and if not, I'll post in a pinned comment down below. Um, obviously inside here, you just have one large, by this point, you just have one large compartment and these are the enlarged later type. Another piece of uh, another piece of late uh, late issue uh, design on here is you don't have the Energa pouch launch uh, the Energa uh, grenade the pouch for the Energa grenade launcher on the side of the pouch there. This is a slightly earlier production, still in the 80s, I think this one, 1988. This one still has the the bayonet loops for the SLR bayonet. That would also be removed, so you get a pair of 1958 pouches late on. I think this is a 1992 dated example, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 1992. Um, just a little design element of the 1958 pattern in the very late production. 
both the bayonet loops and the Energa pouch were removed from the design to streamline them a bit. Though by this point, of course, 58 pattern was becoming obsolete because PLCU was in production and being issued out. So uh, there it is. That's a comparison of the ammunition pouches. Here we have the water bottles and carriers from the two equipment sets. On the left, of course, we have the 1958 pattern in its pouch. And on the right, we have the uh, MVA UTV bottle uh, in its carrier, which is just these sort of rubberized cloth straps. If we turn this over, we can see how this attaches to the belt. There's just a simple loop at the back here with a, with a stud uh, on the, uh, the strap, which loops through this little metal ring. And that just loops around the belt in the same fashion as it had done with the previous uh, MVA designs. Uh, obviously now you don't have a cover over the bottle made in camouflage material, you just have these straps and the, the bottle itself is uh, camouflage uh, painted and uh, covered in this camouflage, um, this olive uh, insulation material which is sort of an expanded foam, as you can see there it is compressible, it's sort of a squishy uh, foam rubber, um, dense foam rubber material. Uh, you can see here at the front, just got a simple strap system that holds the cup on the top, let me get this out, there we go. Roller buckle there, and then the aluminium cup just nests on top using the strap, as you can see there. Uh, and this is basically, I say, a development of, or a, a, not really a development of, just a different shape of cup. It's the same principle as you'd have with earlier uh, German canteen or water bottle sets, going back to even the First World War, certainly the Second World War, very similar sort of thinking and having the little aluminium cup nested on top there. Um, in contrast, of course, the British uh, bottle and cup was a relatively new design, um, made in plastic, introduced in the early 1960s, just a little bit after the 1958 pattern equipment had come out. Um, but based, in principle at least, on the, the preceding 1944 pattern, though of course, there we go, the cup nests on top, as you can see. This will be familiar to, to anyone on watching my channel, I'm pretty sure they're fairly ubiquitous, uh, the 1958 pattern bottle. You can see here that the, um, the UTV bottle is actually a little bit bigger, slightly greater capacity. Um, basically, they're just developments of the design thinking of each country, but you can see the difference in between them here. One advantage of the 1958 pattern is the wide neck. Um, as I say, from point of view of cleaning and so forth, it makes these a, a little bit more practical, but you do have the greater capacity. Uh, both, of course, would have caps introduced to allow them to be used with uh, respirators, so the drinking systems on respirators, be it the, the S10 in British service or the M10M M10M, 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 uh, in um, MVA service. So that's the uh, the water bottles compared. As I say, um, just different design schools really, there's not a huge amount to, uh, um, to, to draw between them. One thing I would say about having the pouch is certainly the second issue pouch where you can actually get the bottle and cup into the, the pouch comfortably you do have capacity to carry uh, sterilizing tablets in the in the lid of the pouch there and so forth so you can carry a few more i guess accessories um but other than that there's not much to draw between them really i would say uh the cup from the 1958 pattern obviously a lot bigger um than the the small aluminium cup here uh but then again this is made of metal so can be heated uh, heated up over a stove or a fire uh, which of course you can't do with the 1958 pattern so swings and roundabouts there i guess uh, but that's the, the water bottles from the two systems. So we talked about the British uh, shovel uh, and its attachment point on the yoke just before. Uh, the MVA have a very different uh, style of entrenching tool, had a very different style of entrenching tool, which is this one part folding example. It doesn't have the pick head, of course, it just has a shovel head, but it folds down into this quite neat little, little uh, unit here. And they made a new cover essentially to go with it for the UTV. It's basically an existing entrenching tool design for which a new cover was introduced. Um, and obviously it's this camouflage, uh, all, in, all covering um, uh, carrier. Unlike the previous frame carriers, although there was a version of this, a slightly earlier version of this with grey nylon fittings and so forth. Not quite sure how uh, widely issued that was. But it made in the, uh, the Strichtan uh, camouflage. And again, we have the... Uh, quick release tabs copied from the 1958 pattern equipment there and as you'll have seen on the back there when I turned it over briefly we have the C hooks to attach it to the belt and belt loops so again those features taken from the British equipment set but essentially an updated version of what had gone before uh, for the uh, MVA's equipment. We'll just talk briefly now about a couple of items which don't have an analog with in the UTV equipment between the 1958 pattern and the UTV um, that's the cape carrier and the rear pouches, the kidney pouches. 
these weren't duplicated essentially as far as I can make out because there isn't really a need for them in terms of the thinking of uh, the design principles behind UTV. I have been informed that the assault pack, the MVA's pre-existing assault pack was used with UTV. How it would attach I don't know or whether it was simply carried by a carrying handle. It's not part of the equipment so I haven't included it here. Um, it's a pre-existing design that according to one of my one one commenter was in fact used alongside UTV. Again, how it was supposed to attach onto the UTV equipment isn't clear. Um, there doesn't seem to be uh, any way of doing so, any easy way of doing so anyway. Um, so in the sort of terms of carrying the subsistence load in your rear pouches, which is what these are for, and carrying originally a poncho, but of course later the MBC equipment, you do have essentially an, an analogue of this in the pre-existing um, MVA's chemical suit carrier, which, as we've already said, would attach onto the yoke of the UTV equipment. Uh, that wasn't this pr the primary purpose of this when it was introduced. It was introduced to carry a poncho, but latterly would be used to carry uh, the MVC kit. So it's not really an analogue in that regard. And similarly, the, the carriage of the subsistence load in the rear pouches, so your mess tins, your wash kit, um, spare socks, you know, stove, rations, etc., uh, that is not really something that uh, is part of the UTV equipment and its design ethos is essentially uh, for armoured infantry only. Although obviously the 1958 pattern was designed in that, with that in mind as well. But uh, the, um, the, the the Eastern Bloc, the Warsaw Pact, basically took that even further and the men were to carry very little in, at all water and, and ammunition essentially and the respirator and so forth. So uh, the equipment, the UTV equipment reflects that in, in lacking uh, particularly these Final thing we're going to contrast here is the respirator haversacks. This, of course, not technically being part of the 1958 pack equipment, but obviously the, the MVA introduced a respirator haversack specifically as part of the UTV equipment. As you can see here, it has all the fixtures and fittings which mark it out as that. So we will compare it to this S6 haversack here. They reflect to a degree uh, differences in thinking. Um, the S6 haversack, if we open this up here, Obviously, we have we do have decontamination uh, kit pouch on the side there. Similarly, uh, obviously, a, a sensible place to stow it, and so a lot of uh, Warsaw Pact respirator haversacks also have the the decontamination pouch, decontamination kit pouch on the outside of the haversack. But getting back to look at the interior here, if we can get some light in here, open up that flap there. We can see here there's a little pouch down in the corner. If I can get some light in there, if we bring it up to the camera, it might. Help. You can see there the form in the corner anyway. This is to take a spare 40 millimeter filter for the respirator. And then we have further decontamination kit. The, the Fuller's Earth bottle would go in here. Combo pens um, for uh, obviously your atropine injection injections in there. And then there is also a loop in the bottom for an anti-dimming outfit, um, which obviously is a cloth, uh, which allows you to put anti-dimming compound on the eyepieces of the respirator to stop them fogging up. Um, there's also carriage in the lid here for gloves, uh, your uh, MBC gloves. So designed to take everything which was part of, of the, the respirator kit and the gloves, essentially. This is actually very similar in many ways, um, but one difference we have, if we look in here, one is it's quite quite a bit more voluminous, it's taller, and it's compartmentalised inside more akin to Second World War British respirator haversacks. And that, of course, is because the Warsaw Pact were using respirators which still consisted of a filter with a hose attached to a face piece and the filter remained in the haversack rather than being attached directly to the, the face piece. That was changing, of course. You had the cheek filter masks, the PBF, the M10, the M10N, uh, and obviously you need a haversack which will contain all of those and this will happily take an M10 and spare filters in here or alternatively it'll take the face piece from say a, 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 a SCH M41 with the, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, I can never remember how to pronounce it correctly, and then the filter in here with the hose attached. So you then have a forward compartment here which will take your gloves, your inner and outer gloves from the chemical suit and a little pouch here which takes the little tin containing anti-fog inserts for the respirator. So it will essentially accommodate any of the respirators in service at the time with the MVA, which is sensible, obviously. There are two little rubber, I don't know if the light will, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get this in here, let's see. No, it's not gonna show it. In the bottom, there are two rubber, um, basically rubber tubes uh, in little pockets, which mean that the, they raise up the filter and, and leave a gap in the middle for the, the bottom of the filter so you can draw air through, basically. So it is just definitely designed to take 
um, respirators with the filter attached to the face piece by a hose, but as I say, an M10 will fit in there quite nicely. And the PBF being smaller will also fit in there quite nicely. So any of the sort of Warsaw pack respirators on issue at the time will happily fit in this. In terms of fixtures and fittings, obviously this doesn't draw on 58 pattern. It uses a press stud and Velcro at the top here, but this does again use the quick release method there. You can see with the tab and the metal loop. I don't do this one handed here rather than reaching around the camera. There we go. Uh, as does the little po pocket for the DKP, uh, the, well, sorry, DKP is British terminology, the decontamination kit, um, the EP68, if I remember correctly. And on the back here, you can see it attaches to the belt using hooks and belt loops, as does the rest of the UTV equipment. Again, the hooks taken from British practice. We turn this over here, we have a belt loop at the back, so it can be carried on the belt, but this has a shoulder strap, as you can see here. Pull this out has a shoulder strap, hooks onto this D-ring over here, and it actually can be carried around the waist on this or over the shoulder, and you have a, a cord here and a little button that that wraps around in old British practice. So it can be worn independent from the equipment. And this is something which would be done in the Gulf War due to the heightened risk of, of well, the heightened NBC threat. The haversacks would be carried independently around the waist on the shoulder strap and therefore could be carried independent of the equipment. It's not possible to do that with this respirator haversack, and I think it's a major failing. There isn't a way, there's no there's no integral shoulder strap, which is something which had been on all, as far as I'm aware, all previous MVA respirator haversacks. So it seems a strange departure, but uh, there we are. Uh, that's what they decided to go for. It can only be worn on the belt of the equipment, although I suppose if you had a separate belt, you could in theory unclip it and clip it to a spare waist belt and wear it on its own. So there we are, that was a look at the various components of the two equipment sets in more detail. I hope that clearly shows, or more clearly shows, the design elements that were taken from the 58 pattern uh, and applied to the, uh, the DDR's UTV equipment. Uh, it's quite interesting to see, um, as I say, the influence there. Uh, and obviously, um, it, as I've said previously in part one, I think that makes this probably one of the best equipment sets to come out of the Warsaw Pact. Um, in terms of design uh, and functionality, uh, it doesn't fall apart when you take it off. It doesn't just, you know, belt loops and things don't just pull off the belt. And it's got this nice padded yoke over the shoulders to help distribute the weight. Um, as I say, there are issues with the design, which I've discussed in the video, but nevertheless, uh, I really like it. I think it's an interesting um, mashup of, of the MVA's previous um, designs, obviously the Strichtarm camouflage pattern and so forth, and then elements of this, this Western design. So uh, there it is. I hope you found that interesting, as I always say. If you have and you'd like to support the channel, uh, there is, of course, the Patreon page, which is being very kindly supported by several of my subscribers. Um, if you check out over there, you can vote on Mannequin of the Month videos if you subscribe to the Corporal tier over there. You also get early access to my uploads as well, so that might entice some of you to go and have a look over there. There's also a PayPal link if you want to make a one-time donation. Very, very kind of those people who have done. Really appreciate it. There's also a Facebook and Instagram page where you can see photographs of the collection and I put updates on there of uh, various events I'm attending and so forth if you happen to be around and want to have a chat. And of course, you can also subscribe to the channel. If you like my videos and you'd like to see more, then please do consider subscribing. Uh, and make sure you hit the little notification button, the little bell. That will, of course, alert you when I do upload future videos. Um, but that's everything I wanted to cover in this video. So until next time, bye for now.